Can everybody hear okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Matthew Conti. I'm a software engineer at Northrop Grumman Electronic Systems up the road in Baltimore. So I'm going to talk a little today about some of our efforts to auto-generate code on our space jobs and uh, reduce our testing and integration time. Okay, so uh, just a little overview, a little bit about our team, why we wanted to auto-generate code, a uh, little bit about the tools that we used to do it, and then the uh, lessons learned from these efforts. So first, a little about our group. We're the Northrop Grumman Space System Software Group. We maintain both the flight and test software for, um, for the space jobs that we work on. Um, so a lot of our flight software, it's embedded, run, uh, we write it in C, mostly C++, and run on VxWorks. And we also have a suite of test software written in the TCL scripting language, uh, which controls our lab equipment, does uh, analysis on telemetry, and uh, other test data that we get. Um, th this program that I'm talking about specifically, it's, we do a lot of defense-related stuff, so I can't get too much into detail. Uh, some of the technical background, though, um, for why we wanted to auto-generate code. So we have a very configurable system. So we have configuration and calibration files, which specify a lot of the operating parameters for the system, anything from power levels to acceptable telemetry levels, things like that, and um, our telemetry definition files. So the way that we, that we use the, this information is at startup, we have C++ classes that read in all this data from the static text files and store them in database classes in memory so that they can be distributed to the, to the rest of the system during runtime uh, as it's needed. Uh, so what makes this a little complex is that we have a lot of these files. Um, I kind of lost count of how many we have, but it's definitely in the dozens uh, and above for each type of file. So there's a lot of configuration going on and a lot of data that we have to store and then uh, provide to, to the software as it runs. Adding to the complexity is that we've just recently moved into the INT phase of our program and so our test engineers are uh, constantly running in the lab. And as they test things, they see things that don't work, they adjust the calibration settings. So several times a day uh, at times, they will even update these files and ask us, ask us to configure them into a new build. So there's a lot of data and it's changing rapidly. Uh, this is a little overview of the development cycle for dealing with these types of configuration files. So the test software or systems engineer will modify the file, they'll add new values, um, adjust the values, change the types as they need during testing. They'll provide those files to us and ask us to um, make changes to flight software so that they can use them. So this involves not only uh, what we show in step, in step three, actually writing the new logic to make use of these fields, but also step two to actually manually update these classes many of which just amount to fancy um, containers, mostly getters and setter methods, because really what we're doing is uh, simulating a database to store these uh, data points as they don't always change during running. So after we make all those changes, we create the new build and provide that to the tester so they can go back in the lab and verify it. Uh, so you can see that the flight software engineers are involved in every step of the cycle which gets to be a lot of work when you also add that on top of the, the development work we have to do to work on the different algorithms and operating modes of the, of the spacecraft. So this kind of shows why we would want to auto-generate the code. Um, not necessarily because we're lazy, but we just don't want to do this work because when it's tedious, not very interesting, and we have a lot of other work to do as well. So the, the real, solving the real technical challenges of the, of the program so if we're constantly being pulled away from that task to do these little minor updates, uh, it really saps our productivity and adds to the schedule because we only have limited uh, personnel. That's the benefit to the flight software engineers. It's also good for program management um, because they always want shorter schedule and lower cost. So if you save developers time by uh, using tools to auto-generate as much as possible, then we can get our work done in a shorter schedule. So a uh, quick overview of the tools we've de developed. We developed a lot of tools in-house for various reasons. I, I know that, there's, that there are tools out there that do auto-generation. Um, working on 
defense jobs, it's sometimes complicated to get software approved to use. So this is what pushed us to do a lot of custom stuff. Also because um, our config files can get complicated. We have things like inheritance where um, config parameters in certain operating modes override <clears throat> more general settings. So we developed a lot of these tools ourselves. So these are the three main tools for configuration parameters, calibration parameters, and our telemetry uh, parser. So uh, in general, they have the same inputs. So we give them, we give the tools the the raw <coughs> raw configuration files, which are usually in text or CSV format, uh, and are provided by the systems engineers. Then we parse those tools, uh, figure out what we need to do with each individual field, uh, and <coughs> and combine that with these uh, class templates so that we can output the final finalized product. So um, I'll give a, <clears throat> a look at two of these tools. First, the configuration parser. This is a really generic example of what one of our config files might look like. It's pretty straightforward, the field names, the values, and the types. So we get this from the test and systems engineers, feed this into our tool, uh, combine it with our um, with our template files, and then outputs the classes with all your getter and setter methods and all the logic for, for updating the, the points or where, whatever else you need. And then, uh, so once that is generated by the tool, then the software engineer can go and implement the logic needed for the new fields so, and provide the builds to the, uh, the testers. So what this tool does is, uh, is basically removes us from the tedious parts of it. You can't obviously remove humans from the entire equation. Right? This step at the bottom here is always going to require a software engineer to make these changes in logic. But now this is the only thing that we have to focus on because the quote unquote grunt work of generating these simple classes has been handled by the tool. So our role has been minimized in the process, so we're not doing as much of this work, like I said. Uh, another benefit is um, the tool is trusted. So we test the tool, and now when we regenerate these classes during the INT phase, we don't have to retest every time we make a small change. So it saves us time uh, in verification as well. Uh, it gives us a quicker turnaround to the, the systems engineers, which is crucial because we are on a tight schedule, like everybody always is, and we have limited testing resources. Uh, so when we're doing bench shifts and a test engineer has a one or two hour shift, uh, each day, they can't really be wasting time waiting for us to turn around the changes that they need. Uh, second, our uh, telemetry parser tool. We just heard how important telemetry is, so we need to get it right as well. Uh, similar, we have like a raw CSV file containing our uh, ICD. This we usually work on in collaboration with our customers, so it doesn't change as often as the uh, config parameters, but they do change. So the same procedure, feed it into the tool, and it outputs, um, outputs code to package up our telemetry into packets and messages to be, to be sent uh, to the test code. Um, so why, this is also important because the telemetry is more complex than the config files. The config files are needed only by our flight software. Telemetry, though, in our lab network has to go back and forth between the flight and test code. So this is like very gen general look at our lab setup. We have test software and then our unit under test with flight software running. And in order to have a test, we need to have the correct telemetry back and forth between them. So this tool really helps us to keep that, that in sync because it generates uh, flight software and test software to package up the telemetry messages and it generates the interface itself in between them. So there's no longer a risk of you fat fingering something on one side, and now you have telemetry messages that aren't that aren't in sync with each other and um, can't be sent back and forth. So it keeps that in sync uh, and reduces the opportunities for us to make mistakes. So uh, with these tools, we'll take another look at the the development life cycle, and you see that the flight software engineers have been taken out of two of the four steps of the process. Now we only have to make the changes where uh, a human program is really needed. So if you're adding new, uh, new configuration parameters, new telemetry parameters that, um, that change how the system operates, 
this is what we have to focus on and not maintaining these, um, these folder classes. Um, so how's it worked out for us? We are seeing a lot of the benefits of it. Uh, like I've been saying, reduced testing time, um, less, less of our time being pulled over to, to help out the systems engineers. Uh, some of the problems, which I'll get into in, our lesson, in the lessons learned slide, is that uh, we need to figure out the development life cycle a little better. This is our first effort at it. So I'll go over a little bit about what, um, what we learned from it. And um, finally, it's been a little bit of a tough sell to management because the lines, the lines of code in the tools are not delivered to the customer. So it takes some convincing to get them to see the value of investing in non-delivered code to the product. And it's kind of understandable that it all comes down to money. So it's really on us to, to show them that it's a worthwhile investment. So finally, a few lessons learned from our auto generation approach. One, probably the most important one that we've learned, the tools need to be finalized as soon as possible, uh, way, well before the INT phase and preferably at the very beginning of the program. So what we've seen is that we didn't do uh, a very thorough job testing the tools. So now that we're using them almost every day, we're discovering new bugs uh, and problems in the files that they generate. And you can see that any time spent maintaining the tool is reducing its usefulness. The whole point is to, is to lessen the amount of code that, you, that you're responsible for maintaining. Um, so as very so upfront at the very beginning of the program, develop the tools, test them, and make sure that they're correct before moving on to the later phases. Um, things will change, formats will change, requirements will change, of course, and you, you have to, there is some maintenance to the tools, but you don't want to be fixing bugs in the tool during INT. You want to be fixing bugs in your flight software. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand with, with developing early is reuse. So we're kind of building these tools from the ground up, learning these lessons as we go. Uh, the hope would be that for future programs, we can give them these tools at the beginning uh, which should let them let, let them get up and running with auto generation early and not have all the headaches that we did. Um, keeping the tools up to date. Um, so there's a lot of changes. Nothing ever stays the same from the requirements phase to the testing to uh, testing phase. But it's important that the tools stay up to date with your new ICDs, with your new um, format definitions. Um, because people will make changes on one side, they'll forget about them, and then a few builds later, you'll go to, to run the tool, and you'll get code that's no longer compatible with your uh, requirements. Uh, one of our engineers has a theory that code has a shelf life, so if you leave milk out too long, it'll just go bad. And it doesn't really make sense to apply it to code, but strangely, he's right in practice. We've seen, like, if you just let the auto-generated code sit there for a couple of builds, uh, it won't work. Um, because somebody forgot about a requirements change or a code change. So um, uh, one, one recommendation would be that when you release new builds, get a clean set of autogen files to make sure everything is up to date. Uh, quick implementation lesson learned. Um, use, use code templates that are in clean uh, templated files. So instead of trying to piece together classes like in our Java tools by like concatenating strings, which gets very messy, read in a template and then replace uh, template fields. Because again, the, the formats will change and it's very easier, it's, it's much easier to keep them up to date if you have them in a, in a clear template file. And then finally, uh, do the work of convincing management that it's a worthwhile investment as, uh, and again, as early as possible. So uh, show them that if you, you invest in developing these tools, it'll save, um, it'll save development time in the, in the long run, especially when you get into the INT and uh, verification phases of the program. So this is all that I had. So um, thank you for listening. And if there's any questions, I'll take them. Interesting topic. Can you uh, give us any idea how big of a product the auto generator builds? And uh, you mean like how big the, the files are that it generates? Um, yeah, dozens of output products or 
tens yeah. of thousands of lines or um, that's probably like a good estimate actually it's in the order of tens of thousands of lines because uh, some of these calibration and config files are big and we generate getter and setter methods for each one there's met methods to to update them at runtime so the I don't have exact numbers but definitely on the order of tens of thousands of lines total among dozens of different uh, configuration files are these primarily accessor pieces with data inside of them encapsulated or is it or are they methods to access data uh, for the most part they're pretty simple container classes that they're essentially like a like a database so other um, other processes running during in flight software at runtime will query these classes to get the configured value. Um, so there is some some logic for updating them, but for the most part, for the most part, it's just simple accessors. Um, can I make a couple of recommendations? Sure. Um, one is. Uh, use the same kinds of systems on our on our stuff here. Um, so one is uh, don't check in your uh, auto generated files. Check in your source files, and then um, rebuild the auto generated products on every build. And that'll prevent users from going in and changing the auto generated files, which would then uh, be the stale issue you're talking Disciplinary about. Disciplinary recommendation, right? Yeah. But then I have a follow-on question. How do you verify that your auto-generation tool is doing fine when you go from one release of that tool to another release? So we, um, I, it does require like doing manual work up front. So you, so one engineer would make sort of like an example file by hand of what, what a, a finalized product should look like. And then we compare it against that to make sure that the tool generates all the functions, all the parameters that we need. So as long as you have a set of those and you keep them up to date as the requirements change, you can verify the tool against that. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Yes.